The United States Civil War was the costliest conflict in American history, killing at least three quarters of a million people. The devastating nature of the war meant that dealing with its consequences would be a complicated affair. The war answered a couple of existential questions for the United States. The first was whether a state had the right to secede. The war's outcome, along with an 1868 Supreme Court case, definitively decided that secession was not a constitutional right. The second question was whether the United States would forever be half-slave and half-free. Abraham Lincoln's goals for the war evolved as the war progressed. First and foremost in his mind was the restoration of the Union. That never changed, however. His opinion on slavery and whether it would still exist did. In his first inaugural address, he stated, I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. Even after the war began and it was not going as well as he had hoped, Lincoln would write newspaper editor Horace Greeley, if I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it, and if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it, and if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. By then he had privately decided to make slavery's demise a goal of the war. Following the Battle of Antietam, he issued his Emancipation Proclamation, but this is not what killed slavery. The proclamation stated that all slaves in rebelling states were forever free. There are a couple of problems with that. First, those rebelling states were, in their minds, a part of a foreign nation. If the Prime Minister of Canada declared that Americans could not legally wear clothing with their favorite sports team's logo on it, would they be legally obligated to follow it? Of course not. The second problem is in the phrase rebelling states. Not every slave state joined the Confederacy. Delaware, Kentucky, Maryland, and Missouri were slave states that remained loyal to the Union. Since they were not in rebellion, they could retain their slaves. It was the 13th Amendment, which would be ratified in December 1865, that officially ended slavery. With those questions answered others would appear. For example, what would happen to the former Confederates since they had committed treason? What would the process be for readmitting the southern states into the Union? Finally, what is going to happen with the millions of former slaves, also known as freedmen? A major debate during Reconstruction would be over who controlled the process, the President or Congress. That dispute brought about the various stages of the period. The first stage would be Presidential Reconstruction. Lincoln thought that since he was putting down a rebellion and was commander-in-chief of the military that was fighting it, he would be in charge of the post-war peace. In 1863, Lincoln had prepared a general outline of what he thought readmitting a state would look like. Historians call it the 10% plan. Nearly every Southerner, except for senior military officers and civilian officials, would receive amnesty on the condition that they swore allegiance to the United States. Once 10% of the number of people who voted in the 1860 election did so, they would then be allowed to create a new state government. The new government would have to acknowledge the end of slavery and elect new federal representatives and senators. Once they are seated, the state would be reconstructed. What was missing from the plan? Where are the treason trials? What did the plan have in mind for securing the rights of the freedmen? This, of course, would certainly be noticed. No senior Confederate leader, including President Jefferson Davis and General Robert E. Lee, was prosecuted for treason. Lincoln's assassination in April 1865 would have drastic consequences for the post-war period. It was clear that had he lived, he would have been magnanimous towards the South. One way we can see this is in a movie poster for the 1915 film The Birth of a Nation. One featured Lincoln's assassination with the caption below it reading, Lincoln's assassination the fatal blow that robbed the South of its best friend. Lincoln's death raised his vice president, Andrew Johnson, to the presidency. His background is helpful to understand why Reconstruction progressed the way it did under him. Johnson was a Southerner, born in North Carolina and raised in Tennessee. He grew up poor and illiterate and became a self-educated tailor. He rose in Tennessee politics, becoming one of its U.S. senators during the secession crisis. One of the consequences of a state secession was that its congressional members in the House and Senate would also leave. 
Although Tennessee seceded, Johnson chose to stay, the only Southern member of Congress to do so. After the Union took control of Tennessee, Lincoln made Johnson its military governor. In 1864, the Republican Party, now known as the National Union Party, put Johnson on the ticket as Lincoln's running mate. Lincoln was concerned that he would not win re-election, so putting a Southern Democrat on the ticket with him would help siphon off votes from his Democratic rival, George McClellan. The concerns were unwarranted since Lincoln easily won re-election. At the time of the assassination, Congress was not in session and would not return until December. Johnson seemed to talk a good game, proclaiming he'd follow Lincoln's plan and take a hardline stance against treason, with Congress in recess. Johnson was essentially alone and did whatever he wanted in regard to Reconstruction, which turned out to be a disaster. Johnson made a departure from Lincoln's plan by adding entries to the list of those who would need to apply for a pardon. Lincoln had excluded from his plan Confederate civil and diplomatic officials, U.S. judges who left to aid the Confederacy, army officers above colonel, and naval officers above lieutenant, members of Congress who left for the Confederacy. Army and naval officers who resigned their commissions joined the Confederate military, and those who mistreated black prisoners of war or their white officers. Johnson included other groups, such as those who left the U.S. to aid the Confederacy, individuals who attended the military academies and then served the Confederacy, Confederate governors, seaborne commerce raiders, or those who raided the U.S. from Canada, and those who were worth $20,000 or more that supported the rebellion, among others. It looked like Johnson was playing hardball, but the numbers didn't add up. By the time he was done, he would receive 15,000 pardons and approve 13,500, or 90 percent of them, in Texas alone. Johnson approved 677 out of 693 or just under 98 percent pardon requests for those who were applicable for one exception. He was a little stricter against those who had multiple exceptions, 44 out of 55, or 80 percent of the applications, were approved. Johnson retained the 10 percent requirement demanding that the states ratify the 13th Amendment, which ended slavery, but he would go no further when it came to the plight of the freedmen. He let the states deal with that issue, although that's not exactly the best plan for the freedmen themselves. For Southerners, Johnson's refusal to go beyond requiring the amendment's ratification was a good deal, since they would not be required to extend any civil rights and the South would acquire more political power. Under the Constitution, slaves were counted for the census, but only three-fifths of them would count for representation in Congress. With slavery gone, so goes the three-fifths compromise, and the former slave population would now be counted in full. This would conceivably bring more representation for the South. For example, in 1860, the 11 former Confederate states totaled 88 votes in the Electoral College, which is the sum of the state's representatives and senators. In 1872, those 11 states now totaled 95. 